All right. Hello. <laughs> Hi, we are we are live to Facebook and YouTube. Um, hello, everyone. Let me just yes, good evening. I'm just going to make sure that we got the Facebook stream going. Yeah, looks like looks like we've got it going. Okay, great. All right. Hello. Um, welcome to Book Week. Uh, my name is Logan McKay, and I'm the Book Week coordinator for SAS Books, which is Saskatchewan's nonprofit creative industry association for book publishing. Thank you all for coming. We are honored to have Wes Olson here to read from his book, The Ecological Buffalo on the Trail of a Keystone Species, published by the University of Regina Press as part of our book week events. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you, Wes Olson, for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> now, before we get into that, um, uh, SAS Books would like to make a few acknowledgements. Uh, SAS Books head office is located on Treaty 4 territory in Regina, and SAS Books work spans the whole province and lands covered by Treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, including the traditional lands of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Dene, and the Métis people. And as part of our commitment to decolonization, we invite everyone to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and consider what actions we might take to dismantle colonialism. Uh, we invite everyone to write in the comments the traditional land that they're viewing from, and we will put a link in there shortly um, that will help you find. We'll also put in a link to the uh, calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We would also like to acknowledge and thank our funders, the Department of Canadian Heritage via the Canada Book Fund and Young Canada Works Building Careers and Heritage, Creative Saskatchewan, and the Canada Council for the Arts, without whose support Book Week would not be possible. We would also like to thank the University of Regina Press for publishing Wes's book. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Wes. Uh, Wes Olson has worked in the field of wildlife and landscape conservation for more than four decades. His career began in the Yukon in 1977, working as a wildlife technician, studying everything from mice and bulls to the porcupine caribou herd. And from there, he moved to Northwestern Alberta, conducting surveys on moose and woodland caribou during the winter and radio collaring, collaring black and grizzly bears in the foothills west of Grand Prairie. In 1981, he began a career as a national park warden in the Banff National Park, then to Waters and Lakes, and in 1984 to Elk Island National Park. It was during his 24 years in Elk Island that he became passionate about everything related to Canada's plains and wood bison populations. During those years, he participated in the reintroduction of bison into many areas of their former historic ranges in Alberta, Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Yukon, Northwest Territories, Alaska, and Central Siberia. Those experiences left him with a deep appreciation for the keystone ecological role that bison provide to the ecosystems they share with other species. So yeah. That's my intro. I will hand it over to Wes. He has a presentation for us today. And yeah, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Logan. It's a treat to be here. Uh, and hello to the audience whom I can't see. Um, so I'll, I'll dive right into it. This is the presentation. And it's called Ecological Buffalo. Uh, bison is a keystone species. 
for a lot of folks, you might not know what the term means. A keystone is the stone at the top of an arch, a wedge-shaped stone that, that holds that whole structure together. If you take the keystone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, it's the same thing with bison. If you take a bison out of the ecosystem, it too collapses. That's the justification for the title. I have to give credit first to my wife, Joanne Janelle. Uh, she's the photographer uh, in all of the images that are coming up. Uh, without her, I, I'd just be a, a handsome talking head. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk about the historical distribution of plains and wood bison in North America. This is the plains bison bull crossing the Lamar River Valley in Yellowstone National Park. We'll talk about how they affect the ecosystems that they live in and who they share the landscape with. And some of the, I'll also provide some examples of some of the species that are directly and inf uh, indirectly influenced by bison on the landscape. This is a map that was put together by Joel Allen in 1876, showing the contraction of uh, historic bison range from uh, 1800 through to uh, the end of the slaughter era in about 1885. At that time, there were 23 animals left in Yellowstone National Park. They were the only wild free-ranging bison left in all of North America. At the same time, there was a population in, in and around Wood Buffalo National Park of wood bison. And by 1900, uh, that population had been reduced to about 250 animals. This is a complex map that you don't need to pay a lot of, of attention to, um, but it shows the various ecoregions in North America, uh, including the Great Plains here. Um, I took this map and compared it to the historic range of Plains bison, and uh, Plains bison occupied roughly 46 of those 116 different ecoregions. Some of the examples of those are in Wood Buffalo National Park, a nice group of small uh, young bulls. Uh, this is a, an ancient bull in Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary, Northwest Territories, uh, southwest of Yellowknife. Um, here's uh, Great Salt Lake and Antelope Island State Park, a very arid, uh, dry landscape. Caprock Canyon State Park in the Panhandle of Texas was one of the last uh, free-ranging bison populations. Um, it was live captured and held in confinement uh, by some ranchers in, in Texas. Uh, and they owe their survival to him. Charles Goodnight was his name. Uh, bison made it all the way down into the oak savannas of the northern Florida panhandle. Um, along the east side of the northern Great Plains uh, is the tall grass prairie. It's a narrow band of vegetation that extends up into southern Manitoba and into the very southeastern corner or southwestern corner of uh, Ontario called the tall grass prairie because many of these grasses will exceed two meters in height. They made it down the Rocky Mountain chain as far south as Grand Tetons National Park in Wyoming and all the way north into the Aspen Parkland in Prince Albert National Park or next door to me here, Elk Island National Park. The majority of the presentation though is going to talk about the northern mixed grass prairie uh, in and around Grasslands National Park. And this is a typical winter scene there. For those who don't know where that is, um, this is the Cypress Hills, this little ring here of unglaciated land. And Grasslands National Park sits right on the Montana Canadian border in southern Saskatchewan. And this red line outlines the northern mixed grass prairie. It's a complex landscape. And traversing this photograph from left to right is the French Run River Valley. It has its headwaters in the Cypress Hills and it flows southeasterly and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi drainage. On the north side, which is where we're looking here into the photograph, um, the continental ice sheets at the end of the Pleistocene stopped there. And on the south side of the river, uh, in this knob and kettle topography, uh, Cordillera and ice sheets that moved east from the Rockies stopped here. It's the only place where the two glaciers met. Uh, continental sheets melted and retreated northwards, leaving behind very long meltwater channels, linear creek drainages that flowed uh, from north to south. South of the river, uh, the continental or the Cordillera and ice sheets melted and just dropped straight down, leaving behind all of the glacial till in this complex knob and kettle topography. That combination of landforms north and south of the river created an ideal place for both people and for bison. 
So how do bison impact the ecosystems that they live in? Now here's a pretty classic example of a pair of breeding brown-headed cowbirds uh, getting their feet warmed on the head of this bison. But they do it in three principal ways. And the first is, the, is their, simply their physical disturbance on the landscape. And that's everything from the fresh deposition of uh, urine and uh, nutrients it contains to the winter trails that bison punch through the heavy snowpack of uh, wind-drifted slopes in, in grasslands. And subtle little things like providing a, a, a listening platform for a robin who speckled this dropping with her own as she sat on there listening for insects. Bison uh, wallows, of course, are a pretty significant feature uh, and pretty clear disturbance. And patch grazing. Patch grazing is the reason why almost every new bison population is being established. It's this microhabitat that's created by bison when they graze on the landscape. And pugging. Pugging is just simply a fancy word for footprint, a track driven deep into the clay. And this is so significant that in Siberia years ago, a guy named Sergei Zimov from Russia and his American counterpart, Mimi Chapin from Alaska, showed that it's just the simple action of having this hoof scarification on the landscape can return seeds that are still dormant in the landscape from the end of the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago. They're still viable. And the presence of large hoof mammals like bison on the landscape can cause those seeds to germinate. And of course, uh, urine, as I just mentioned. Horning and rubbing of trees and shrubs with a very significant and direct impact on the landscape. Uh, these authors suggested that it was the removal of um, bison from the landscape that caused the expansion of the Aspen Parkland, uh, both in a southerly direction and in a western direction. Um, and that had a huge impact for species like um, the, the spotted owl and forests of the West Coast, because it allowed the uh, barred owl to move from eastern hardwood forests across that newly expanded Aspen Parkland and eventually all the way over to the West Coast. Some of the more direct relationships, here's a very nice wood bison bull from the north. Uh, obviously, wolves have a, a pretty clear direct relationship with, with bison. Uh, wood Buffalo National Park and region is the only place in North America where there was um, no disconnect between the major predators of bison, like wolves, uh, and bison themselves. Uh, ravens, of course, will follow along and uh, consume the carrion that's left behind after a wolf has, has done his thing. In Yellowstone, we watched this uh, big boar grizzly uh, feed on this carcass that he just killed, the plains bison cow. And within a short while after he had, had his fill, a sow came along with three of her yearling cubs and pretty much consumed the rest of her, leaving behind bones like this on the landscape. The estimates are somewhere between 30 and 60 million plains bison once occupied North America, and with a, even a 3 to 5 percent natural mortality, that equates to a lot of carcasses on the landscape. And these gave a, an ephemeral and very intense pulse of nutrients into the local environment. Here's an example in Elk Island National Park. This was an older bull that had been uh, gored and uh, subsequently died from his injuries during the breeding season. And the park counted uh, 18 different coyotes coming to feed on that carcass until it was completely gone. <coughs> uh, this is the little uh, sexton beetle. He's maybe half an inch long, uh, five millimeters or more. Um, they have the amazing ability to detect a carcass on the landscape and then uh, fly to it. They're called a sexton beetle because just like the sexton in the church, uh, they're responsible for burying the dead. Uh, and they'll take apart that bison or bits of that bison and bury it underground. The female will lay their eggs and those will reproduce and, and carry on the, the species. This guy's carrying a load of phoretic mites, little wee tiny insects that are not much bigger than the, the head of a match. They can't obviously get to a carcass easily, so they hitchhike on the back of the sexton beetle. They hop off on the carcass and, and do their life cycle reproduction. Uh, some of the indirect relationships. I mentioned facilitative grazing, that patch grazing. It's a, a very important one, and we'll get into that in more detail. Um, they have some relationships then because of the grazing of bison with white-tailed deer, and the endangered nuttles or mountain cottontail. 
um, mule deer, of course, pronghorn, you know, black-tailed prairie dogs, and white-tailed jackrabbits. Each of these are herbivores that uh, increase in abundance when bison are on the landscape, simply because of the way that bison increase that, that ecosystem. In some broader food web relationships, um, there's known to be at least 77 different grasshopper spe species in Grasslands National Park. Um, and they're a food for a whole host of uh, insectivores, such as the Western jumping mouse, um, red fox, swift fox, and coyotes. Uh, red squirrels uh, can salvage the hair off of a bison um, or clumps of hair that have landed on the landscape. And this is an example of a, a footprint that was driven deep into the midnight clay in, in grasslands. And a horned lark uh, wolf in the bottom of that footprint made her nest entirely out of shed bison hair. And then a brown headed cowbird came along and parasitized it with three of her eggs. And shed bison hair, we'll get into in more detail, but it's one of the critical components for a healthy ecosystem when bison are back on that landscape. And it's all because of pasture grazing the way that these animals forage across the landscape. They share the northern mixed grass prairie uh, with a whole host of species. Uh, this is a pretty typical scene in the summer months. We took in, 19, in 2005, uh, 71 plains bison from Milk Island National Park to grasslands and established this population. Um, the park currently manages it at between 350 and 400 animals, uh, removing a surplus every two years to establish or supplement other conservation herds. This is a horned lark. There's 26 endemic grassland birds in the region, and nine of these can only be found in diverse grasslands like this, and they're known as obligate grassland birds. You won't find them in any other ecosystem. Here's nine of them. Every one of these species is a species at risk in Canada right now, um, and they're rapidly declining across all regions of their former historic range. There's been a fair amount of work done by university students looking at the abundance of these species outside the park and inside the park, comparing uh, abundance to lands grazed by bison and lands grazed by cattle. And they're finding virtually all of these species are increasing in abundance where bison are grazing. The Northern mixed grass prairie has got 35 mammal species. Well, a dozen of these are obligate, like the, uh, the um, Blackfoot, Blacktail Prairie Dog in this photograph. Here's uh, some examples of them. And I'll get into more detail in some of these species coming up. Uh, if you've not been out on the prairie on a, a warm moonlit night, uh, if you sit back and listen, you can hear this little fellow, the grasshopper mouse, sits up on his hind feet and howls at the moon like a miniature coyote. Really quite a remarkable sound. And we'll touch more on the black-footed ferret and prairie dogs uh, in, in the northern pocket gopher coming up. I enticed my wife to get as close as she could to, to this snake to get a good photograph. Fortunately, she was using a long lens and was at a safe distance. But there are all the good grassland reptiles and amphibians in the park. Here's nine of them. Um, some of these were very threatened at the end of the bison era, in particular this big footed toad and the Great Plains toad. Um, all of these species experienced massive population declines during the 1800s and early 1900s. So how do they influence these species? Um, this is an example of a young bison bull wallowing. Um, they do it through a variety of ways. Um, but the first is through their ability to create a heterogeneic grassland community, a diverse grassland ecosystem. Here's a pair of brown-headed cowbirds foraging on insects that this bison is disturbing. There was a neat series of photographs taken by a photographer in uh, Antelope Island State Park in, in the middle of Great Salt Lake. He has photographs of these birds flying up and drinking the mucus that drips out of the nostrils of a bison. Um, because it's such an arid landscape, there's virtually no freestanding water. And by doing that, they obtain moisture, but also the microbes and the nutrients that are contained within that mucus. Really quite a neat adaptation. All of this leads to enhanced habitat for other uh, prairie species like the pronghorn. But how does it happen? Well, I just mentioned it. It all starts with this. This is my favorite uh, biome on the, on the northern Great Plains. As bison are grazing across the landscape, they're taking in huge breaths of air 
a, you know, a very large uh, lung capacity and the largest trachea of any North American land animal. Uh, they can inhale incredible volumes with each breath. And when they do that, they're constantly inhaling the microbes that are on the vegetation and just on the soil surface. And all of that gunk gets caught up in the nasal vestibules and the mucus that lines the vestibules. And periodically, they have to lift their heads and clean out their nostrils. Cattle do this as well. You'll see them give a quick flick to each nostril to, to clean them out. And in doing so, they're swallowing all the bacteria, fungi, and microbes that they've been, uh, inhaled. These things are uh, incredibly important uh, for the breakdown of fibrous vegetation. Without them, an, an ungulate couldn't, a herbivore like this could not uh, digest the food that they eat. Each um, nostril full has millions of these microbes uh, and they contribute a significant amount of the protein to the diet of the animal, upwards of a quarter uh, of the protein that this animal would get through his diet is actually the digestion of um, these microbes. Once he's digested, once he's swallowed that gunk, uh, it goes into the rumen. And this is a pretty magical place. Uh, there's a completely functioning ecosystem here with predators and prey. Uh, the fungi break down the starches so the bacteria can digest it. The bacteria in turn down, in turn, and break it down into sugars and protein and fiber that the bison can then digest. And then along come the protozoa, uh, the hunters of bacteria and, and fungi. These are the significant predators on other microbes. Uh, each protozoa can, uh, contain hundreds, if not millions, of uh, different microbes and bacteria, uh, amazing animals. This whole system is designed to break down the cellulose so the bison can digest it. Here's an example of uh, a protozoa. Um, there's literally millions of these within the rumen of a bison, and each of these contains millions of bacteria. They're the equivalent to a blue whale swimming through the ocean eating krill. And of course, everything that they eat uh, comes out the other end eventually and lands in a very photogenic bison patty like this one. Um, and living in that nicely contained ecosystem is a completely functioning society of predators and prey again. Um, it's first colonized through the digestive pro process with um, the fungi, bacteria, and protozoa that we just mentioned. But then they're, they are almost immediately hunted and preyed upon by beetles and flies. Uh, and within a few minutes of the arrival of these insects, there's a whole host of predatory insects that come along and hunt uh, this guild of, of insects. So completely functioning ecosystem uh, within this. By some estimates, um, one buffalo patty can, can host up to 100 different insect species. And over the life of that patty, upwards of a, uh, a thousand different insects over the course of its lifespan on the prairie. Now, this is a dung beetle. Um, it's a, a Photius fimitarius. It's an insect that arrived in North America from uh, Europe in cattle dung on a ship that came into the Boston Harbor in, in the late 1800s and has since colonized most of, of North America. Dung beetles uh, don't actually eat the dung. Uh, they'll splat head first into it and then immediately create air channels to the surface and then go back in and, and start consuming the protozoan bacteria that, that are still living within that dung pad. And there's lots of records of a healthy ecosystem. These dung pads will completely disappear in a matter of just a few days, simply from the disturbance by insects. So to put that into a perspective, I, I did this illustration showing um, three functional gills of, of dung beetles. Um, one of the first to arrive is the species like the Apodius spimitarius. He's the dweller, uh, the, the land on the dung pad. Uh, the females will create a chamber and then create brood balls, each of which has one egg in it. And she'll populate that, that dung pad with little chambers like this. Another group are the uh, burying dung beetles. There's two guilds of them, fast burying and slow burying tunnelers. Uh, each of these create chambers deep into the soil, depending on soil type, up to two meters, um, but typically probably uh, 30 centimeters or so. The females will, like, like these guys, take down one brood ball, a third in the chamber, and put one. <clears throat> excuse me, um, lay one egg in it. There's different types, different species have different ecologies. Um, 
These ones are quite quick at their process, and these are quite slow. And then there's the classic rollers, um, the ones we always envision when we think dung beetles, the guys who, the females will lay a, an egg in one brood ball and take it across the prairie, dispersing it either just underneath the, the vegetation or perhaps up in the, in the vegetation. And they in turn become prey for species like the long-billed curlew or the Macomb's longspur. Here's two rollers. Uh, this is a species called Canthon pilularis. One female's created the brood ball, and the other one is trying to take it from her. Um, dung beetles are the only insect guild in the world that uses celestial navigation in their reproductive cycle. They'll, uh, on a full moon night, if you're out there where there's healthy populations like this, uh, you'll see them leaving a dung pat in the direction of a full moon, or on a, a moonless night in the direction of the Milky Way. And they do that as a way to disperse their eggs and their, their brood balls uh, away from the dung pat that they've colonized. As I mentioned, one dung pat can host up to 100 uh, species and 1,000 individual insects. And there's one study that shows that a bison, just from her dung, can produce a quarter of her body mass in insects every year. Tremendous biological output when, when you think of 30 million bison on the landscape. So I took uh, William Hornady's graph of population decline of plains bison, where he documented from 1861 through to about 1890, a rapid population crash of bison. They were extirpated by 1890. So based just on a quarter of a, a, um, a cow's body mass, I calculated the number of insects uh, that would be produced. And it reached upwards of 300 billion uh, insects every single day. Tremendous biological output. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a complex map. It's here simply to show that of all the bird species that are uh, declining right now, grassland birds are suffering the most. Uh, wetland birds are, are doing okay. But all of these uh, bird species are uh, declining it to one degree or another. And the grassland birds, this is that region that we're talking about, are the ones that are rapidly declining. So how do bison affect these ecosystems in the grass communities? It all starts in the winter. Uh, the first winter, 2005, 2006, that we put bison on in grasslands, uh, we held them in confinement until the spring. They grazed the landscape through the summer months, and then in the winter, they were forced to forage through the snowpack. And this is what it would look like. These bison will go along and they shift the snow away with their foreheads, grazing the vegetation that's underneath there, creating grazing logs. And here's an example of a, about a five-year-old bull creating a, gra a grazing log. When spring arrives, this is what's left. This is a very uniformly grazed, intensely grazed patch of vegetation surrounded by taller, ungrazed vegetation. And just like our lawns, when we mow it, you know, we have to come back every two or three days and recut it. And the same thing happens here. Um, as these bison graze the patch, they'll leave it, they'll come back to it and regraze it. And that's what the patch looks like in the summer, in that same patch, surrounded by tall vegetation that's untouched. And the, the whole herd will repeatedly visit these previously grazed sites uh, throughout the summer months until the, the growing season stops and no new growth is, is, is produced. And it's at that point it, that this whole cycle is timed uh, to create the, the ideal conditions for plains bison to, to breed. So the peak of the breeding season for plains bison is the 15th of July to the 15th of August, with variation around that, sort of the peak of August 1st. By the end of, uh, what, by the, end of the middle of, of August, um, these grasses have stopped growing. There's no point in regrazing them. And the, the, the mass of rutting herds that we heard historically, at that point, they would fragment and disperse back across the landscape in, in smaller and smaller herds, uh, seeking out then and grazing these uh, taller, coarser vegetation. And that's what it looks like from the air. There's this incredible vegetation diversity here. When Grasslands National Park was established in 1987, uh, it was through the purchase of a ranch that um, the rancher had decided to retire, um, so he sold to the park. And over the years, park, the park accumulated numerous ranches and amalgamated them together to create the West Block 
uh, where these bison are. And the policy at that time was to remove bison, I mean, remove the cattle from the landscape uh, as soon as the purchase had been finalized. They took down all of the internal fencing, all of the farm infrastructure, and created a, an, essentially an empty landscape. That had a negative impact on the vegetation uh, diversity, uh, creating a situation where grasses outcompeted forbs and you ended up with a grass dominated landscape, uh, one that did not have the same level of diversity. Some of the interspecies relationships, here's, here's two non native ones the European starling and crested wheatgrass. Crested wheatgrass was brought into Canada from Siberia in the 1930s because it's got an excellent soil stabilizing root system. It rapidly colonizes uh, wind blown uh, pastures and uh, stabilizes them, but it's a non native plant. So here's what I was talking about with the uh, grass diversity and uh, grassland uh, uh, heterogeneity. When, when the cattle were removed after a couple of years, you still had a, a complex grass ecosystem, many different species, but you don't see any forbs here, no flowering plants, and as a result, no tap roots. Grasses produce long fibrous roots to go deep into the soil uh, as a way to extract nutrients and, and moisture, um, but it's a very fibrous, uh, thin root system. When you put bison back on the landscape, that begins to change. Those grazing lawns I mentioned can't sustain that level of grazing indefinitely. And eventually uh, the, the roots of grasses uh, shrink, they, they come work quite close to the surface and it begins to be repopulated with forbs, flowering plants like this um, winter fat. It's called winter fat because it produces extremely high levels of protein and cattle actually gain uh, fat on it during the winter months. Eventually, as that uh, grazing lawn expands in size, uh, the whole ecosystem begins to be affected by bison, you get a greater floristic diversity of, of plants, including a, a greater number of plants with tap roots and the ability of species like the Nuttall's cottontail uh, to move back into those systems and, and begin to rebound. And eventually you end up with a very complex ecosystem um, that the park has today, both above ground and below ground, a whole host of different species uh, of uh, insects and mammals, birds, a uh, very complex ecosystem. And that's very important for this guy, uh, the northern pocket gopher. Um, a lot of people view these guys as pests because of the way that they uh, bring soil to the surface. But they're a neat animal because they create these horizontal burrow systems just underneath the soil surface uh, as a way to access those thick tap roots that the flowering plants have been producing. One study showed that it takes 3,500 times as much energy to travel one meter underground as it does one meter overground. And these guys can't do that on grassroots. They have to have those tap roots. And that's these burrow systems then are incredibly important. This is just a short list of species that are known to use these burrow systems as part of their ecology, either as winter hibernation places, summer estivation, um, Tremendous, tremendously important for grassland species. This was the neat study that came out of um, the southwestern US. Um, these biologists went to museums and they, they collected samples of snakes that had been rattlesnakes that had been preserved. And then they opened those snakes up to see what they'd been eating. And in doing that, they discovered that snakes don't have the enzymes that allow them to digest vegetative material only the meat and tissues of, of their prey. Um, so that means that an animal like this bison that's grazing, foraging, will consume seeds, perhaps on the western side of, of the park. We put radio collars on bison cows like this, and uh, it showed that they can walk up to 10 kilometers a day from their morning feeding site to their evening feeding site. And in doing so, they'll, they'll consume grass seeds. At the end of that 10 kilometers, the herd will bed down, uh, chew their cud, uh, ruminate, get up, and then uh, deposit a bison patty on the landscape, containing the seeds that she'd ingested upwards of 10 kilometers away. Um, those uh, dung pads then are colonized by species like these dung beetles. And in that brood ball are perhaps the seeds that she ingested, uh, that the female bison ingested that morning, 
and these dung beetles will take those seeds and bury them in the soil surface where they'll germinate in this rich medium. Then along comes an animal like the Ords kangaroo rack or a pocket mouse, um, and then a snake uh, manages to snag one of these. Uh, in this case, the Ords kangaroo rat has packed his cheek pouches full of Indian rice grass, perhaps dozens if not a uh, hundred seeds packed into their fur-lined cheek pouches. Um, so as the snake ingests those snakes, and I mean, as the snake ingests those pocket mice, and they do capture between 12 and, and 20 pocket mice over the course of a summer, and they travel tremendous distances. The snake is di uh, digesting that mouse as it tra travels through the uh, digestive system. And when it reaches the colon, most of the mouse is digested, um, but because they lack the ability to digest the, the seeds, those seeds germinate inside the snake and then leave the snake in the, a little trail of uh, fully germinated uh, grass seeds um, miles and miles away from where that original um, seed was perhaps captured by a, by a bison. Tremendous complex interrelationships of, of plants, species, herbivores, predators, all combined into one neat little guild of, um, uh, in that ecosystem. The introduction of bison shed here to the ecosystem is incredibly important. There's been a lot of work looking at how valuable this, this fiber is to the system. Um, bison shed their hair in the spring and it snags on everything that they touch. It's the second warmest natural fiber in all of North America, next only to the, the fine wool of the musk oxen, the kiviet. It's a tremendously uh, warm fiber. And in virtually every bird species that breeds in bison habitat lines their nests with shed bison hair. This is a chickadee nest in Prince Albert National Park, and it's got a mixture of the black guard hairs and the thick under fur uh, that she used to line the nest. This is just a very short list, but every place that we've been, birds are using bison hair to line their nests. And it's important because just like with this uh, Richardson ground squirrel. Studies have shown that having bison hair in the nest of a, of a songbird provides a tremendous thermal warmth for the chick, for the eggs and then later the chicks. It also provides all the factory masking. The, the strong smell of the hair hides the smell of the, the nest from the inquisitive noses of badgers and uh, raccoons and other uh, grassland predators. And it's extremely water repellent. So on those wet, cold spring days, when there's a, a nest full of um, newly hatched chicks, it increases their survival by up to 60%. This photograph was taken in a, a region of the grasslands that the bison had only just recently colonized. In particular, one bull had moved in there and, and created a wallow in the spring and was rubbing off his, his winter coat. This female Richardson ground squirrel discovered that. You can see she's nursing. And she made repeated trips from that wall over he was shedding his hair down into her burrow system. There hadn't been a bison on that landscape probably for 140 years. But she instinctively knew the value of, of that fiber and took advantage of it. Similar situation took place in the Yukon where an old wood bison bull had died uh, one winter. Uh, and squirrels like this one gathered that material and, and built their entire nest out of it. Uh, the entire thing, there was a few twigs and branches in it, but most of it was shed bison hair. Um, they found five um, squirrel nests like that around that carcass. All of that leads to increased survival of uh, squirrel babies, which then feeds fine martens and avian predators, uh, everything that might eat a, a squirrel. Bison wallows are one of our fascinating places that we like to visit. Um, just in this one wallow in grasslands, there's 12 species of uh, mammals, birds, reptiles, all of their tracks uh, in this one wallow. We think of these as the guest book of Prairie Society. Everybody comes here to dust bath and leave behind their signatures you know, for us to come along and investigate later. This is in Prince Albert National Park, just in uh, a couple wallows. Here's some black bear and wolves, coyotes, insects, uh, shorebirds, uh, geese, tremendous variety of species using these, these wallows. And on the Northern Great Plains, or the Great Plains generally, um, these wallows held water in the spring. 
called vernal wetlands. Um, all through the background here, these are ancient bison walls that were created and, and maintained for probably hundreds of years by passing bison. Um, they've all grown in with vegetation. and They don't hold water like an actively maintained one does. Um, so these are incredibly important um, for these guys. The spade-footed toad and the uh, Great Plains toad. The spade-footed toad in particular uh, has a unique lifestyle that um, she can hop into this wall and then within 10 days out hops a fully morphed adult. As the tadpoles hatch, you can see that their eyes are facing sideways. That's a classic uh, prey response to uh, the approach of predators, giving them 360 degree uh, view. As the depth of that wall of water decreases, it also warms. And as the temperature warms, the skull morphology of this tadpole will change and the eyes begin to face forward. Uh, just like on the adult, and they'll switch from feeding on algae to hunting and consuming other insects and smaller tadpoles. And within 10 days, this wallow has dried out and out hops a fully morphed adult. It's the fastest metamorphosis of, of any reptile or amphibian. I was out one spring in a cold, blustery, really miserable day, on and off sleet, snow, rain, sun, uh, everything combined within you know, half hour periods. And I noticed this pair of pronghorn does um, on the side of a slope. So I stopped to, to look at them and then realized that this doe had just given birth to twins in an ancient bison wallow. Um, she stayed for a little while and the bonds got up and stumbled at her feet and they went around the, the slope and, and out of sight. So I walked over there to where she'd just given birth and laid down in that wallow. Um, right where this, this young guy is. Um, it's only about 30 centimeters deep, but there wasn't a breath of wind. It was perfectly calm on the bottom of that ancient bison ball. And she knew that. She sought that spot out uh, just to give birth. Tremendous relationships there. And bison and prairie dogs uh, have a thousands of year long relationship. Uh, they both entered North America probably about 130,000 years ago. Uh, prairie dogs a little more recently, um, but they've established relationships that go back tens of thousands of years. Prairie dogs need these short grazed patches of grass. Um, they want to be able to see predators coming, both mammalian and avian. And bison have the ability to push back the tall grasses around the edge, allowing prairie dogs to increase the size of their towns. Uh, like bison, prairie dogs are considered a keystone species because of the, the ability that they have to support other species on the landscape. For example, the burrowing owls. Uh, here's triplets of a brand new pups that just came to the surface. And the, a pair of burrowing owls have nested in this uh, abandoned prairie dog burrow here. Uh, these guys have a neat relationship with bison. And we've got photographs showing burrowing owl males, they're the first ones to arrive in the spring and they'll search the landscape for buffalo patties and they'll break that patty up and bring it back to the burrow entrance, line, cover the burrow entrance with it, decorate the, the entrance. And then once the female has looked down there and thought, oh, hey, here's a good provider, I'll, I'll shock up with him. She goes into the burrow system uh, and, and lays her eggs down there. The male, meanwhile, will go out and gather more dung, bring it back and break it up and scatter it down the burrow entrance. That attracts beetles, which are the primary source of uh, food for these guys early in the spring. And it allows the newly hatched chicks the ability to hunt those beetles in the security and the safety of their burrow system. Tremendous adaptation. Um, and the dung that goes down into the burrow system acts as a relative humidity control mechanism, maintaining a constant relative humidity of about 60%. It absorbs moisture on wet days and then releases it on hot days, maintaining a perfect temperature and humidity inside the burrow system. This is a mountain plover. I didn't know she was on the landscape uh, until she exploded up underneath my feet. It, this photograph is her standing on a dried buffalo patty. Uh, they're obviously a, an albicate grassland bird. This is what her nest looked like after I, uh, after I found it three eggs laid in a crumpled up bison patty, perfectly camouflaged. If she hadn't exploded underneath my feet, I, I never would have seen this. 
sage grouse and sharp-tailed grouse both require short grass areas to perform their, their spring licking behaviors. Um, and bison create large patches of short grass for these guys. And we're seeing an increase in, in particular of the sage grouse where bison have been grazing. And not just here in grasslands, but uh, throughout the historic range where bison are back on, on, the, on grasslands. The park introduced 71 black-footed ferrets over several years, uh, quite a few years ago now, um, in an attempt to help sustain and uh, re-establish this uh, species on the landscape. The effort didn't work. Um, it turns out that prairie dog uh, fleas that carry sylvatic plague in wildlife, it's known as sylvatic plague, in people, it's the bubonic plague, black death that wiped out Europe three times, exactly the same disease. Well, it turns out that the disease is uniformly fatal to ferrets. The park lost a few to vehicle accidents that got run over on the road. Um, they know of some avian predation by hawks and owls, uh, but the rest just quietly disappeared from the landscape. And that's when they discovered that the sylvatic plague might be playing a role in this population. So the park has been going out uh, treating selected prairie dog towns, the borough systems, with an insecticide called Delta Methrin. Um, prairie dogs will take that insecticide down deep into the borough systems, into the nesting chambers where it, it kills the fleas. And they've shown now that where this practice is under, underway, um, that the fleas have disappeared. And there's talk now of reintroducing uh, ferrets once again to that landscape. We know of three different occasions, or three different pairs of badgers and coyotes hunting cooperatively together. Um, it's really quite neat to see two apex predators cooperatively hunting a species like prairie dogs. Prairie dogs build two types of mounds, a domed mound like this one in the foreground, and in the background, uh, like this one here, little volcano-shaped mounds, uh, rimmed mounds. They're connected underground, and as the wind flows across the prairie, it enters here and comes out there. And these guys are sniffing this like you would the exhaust coming out of the back of a bakery, trying to figure out who's in there. Depending upon the situation, the badger then will start digging. The coyote will move over here and wait till a prairie dog pops up into its jaws. Uh, on other occasions, we've seen them. Um, the coyotes will be bedded down, completely, apparently sound asleep. Uh, but carefully watching the prairie dogs all around them. The prairie dogs are all totally focused on the coyotes. And meanwhile, coming up from behind uh, is the badger, picking off the unwary prairie dogs that are focused on the coyotes. Really quite an amazing um, adaptations for these two apex predators. Here in the Aspen Parkland, where Joanna and I live, uh, this is in Elk Island National Park. This pretty typical scene, you know, lots of water bodies, low-lying wetland marshes and grassy slopes. And this is where the bison tend to congregate in the spring. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they'll forage on these green grassy patches, then move to the forest edge like, like this bull has done to chew their cud, ruminate, sleep. And invariably they get up and, and just like that other photogenic patty, they'll leave one of these behind. But because they're bedded adjacent to the forest edge, there's a higher density of bison patties close to the forest than there is out in the meadow system. I was out one year in the park many years ago, and I saw this young woman crawling around on her hands and knees in the middle of one of these meadow systems. It puzzled me what she was up to, so I went over and, and asked her. Turns out she was a, a biologist from Finland doing her PhD on the slave-making behavior of one ant species on another. And to do that, she'd follow an individual ant of one species as it traversed the grassland. Uh, it would arrive at a different anthill species, ant species, and snag a slave, take that slave back to its host colony, home colony, and uh, turn it into a slave. Um, and in doing that, she discovered that virtually every anthill in, in grasslands, pardon me, in, in Elk Island, is established on a bison paddy. The queens seek them out and uh, use them as an nutrient base to start their colonies. And that's important for these guys, the northern flicker. The, these guys are very selective on what they eat. Uh, they create nesting cavities that are close to the forest edge, 
to hop out their forage on ants and, and ground insects and bring it back to the nest to feed their young. Uh, tremendous biomass of ants that these, these birds consume. And that's important for these guys, the northern flying squirrel. Well, it turns out that the cavity size of the northern flicker is, is the Goldilocks of cavities for flying squirrels. Other birds, other woodpeckers create one uh, cavity that's either too small or, or it's too big. Uh, but these guys are, are perfect for the flying squirrel. And it turns out the flying squirrels are, are fussy about the cavities that they use. They have some that are strictly used as refugia, places where they'll shelter, where they'll rest or escape predation. Others that they use just for rearing their young. And others that they use just for their toilet. And over time, these toilet cavities can accumulate a fair amount of flying squirrel dung, which is important for this little guy, you know, four to 11 millimeter long dung beetle, um, who lives primarily on flying squirrel dung. So if you didn't have that sequence of events of having bison grazing those slopes where the flickers uh, forage and then nest, this little guy would have a hard time surviving. So at the end of the 1880s, early 1890s, this was probably a pretty typical scene on the, on the Great Plains, a vast empty landscape uh, speckled with bison carcasses, a pretty depressing scene. Um, and one that was difficult for, uh, well, especially difficult for First Nations people uh, to go from that thriving landscape of 30 million bison to a desolation like this. Um, I, there was a new study that uh, sort of took that thought a little bit further their analogy was that this aircraft, the DC-3, can fly through the air and function quite fine. Um, and people inside, little gnomes, can be taking parts out of it, you know, rivets, you know, critical circuits, whatnot. And eventually, a critical component will be removed uh, and the plane will crash. This is a schematic of that airplane and all the parts that are in it. And you can take those parts out and the plane will continue to fly until one critical component is, is removed. And when that happens, the plane crashes. Ecosystems crash either because it's been overloaded, as in the case of this plane, locally known as Miss Piggy. And she took off from the airport in Churchill, Manitoba, overloaded and, and crashed, or because uh, one critical component has been removed. The same thing happens in ecosystems. So when you put bison back on that landscape, that critical component, you can suddenly bring back, well, not suddenly, it takes time, but you can bring back all of the other components of that ecosystem just by having that keystone animal back on the landscape. So when you think back to this complex map in the 46 ecoregions that uh, bison once occupied, um, and the fact that we only talked about this tiny little spot uh, beside the Cypress Hills, the biomass, the tremendous diversity of ecosystem relationships must have been astounding. And today, whether bison uh, exist on small farms that are scattered from Mexico to Alaska, or in large national parks like Grasslands or Yellowstone, each of those bison populations provides a, a place for birds to refuel on their migration north and south. Uh, insectivores rely tremendously on, on healthy ecosystems uh, full of insects. So for, for me, perhaps the most important conclusion is that every every herd of bison, regardless of its size or ownership, uh, can play a role in improving in, uh, ecosystem diversity. All of that summed up in our new book, The Ecological Buffalo. Um, this talk just covered a tiny portion of what's contained in the book. Uh, and I encourage you to go out and, and get your own copy. And at that point, we'll be happy to answer any questions that the audience might have. OK. Um, yeah, do we have any questions uh, in our audience? I know we are pretty close to time, so uh, any, a couple quick questions from anyone? Somebody's got to have at least one question. Yeah, uh, we have um, a question from Emily. 
how do bison fare after being in, reintroduced to places like grasslands? Do they have many predators or others dangers to watch out for? No predators. Um, in other places across the north, for example, we established a herd in the Yukon in the late 70s, early 80s, into a, a region that had a viable and thriving wolf, wolf population. Um, to date, they've not found wolves to be significant predators on bison. Um, it's a risky thing to try to eat. They'll scavenge carcasses. Uh, they will eventually learn how to hunt bison, but uh, to date, they're not a significant predator on them. Um, in grasslands, there are no predators for bison, so it's all human management. That's actually interesting. Do they have to, do the wolves have to relearn how to hunt bison? Exactly. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky thing. Imagine attacking the kicking back end of a bison with your teeth. Uh, it's not an easy chore. Um, it's undoubtedly taking place with smaller animals, uh, calves, for example. They reintroduced bison for, in, into Banff National Park in 2017, and they think they've lost one calf to wolf predation. Uh, it's unconfirmed. Otherwise, that population is doing very well. I see. Um, let's see. Can you, uh, uh, Karen says, thank you, Wes, and thank you to Johan for the incredible photos. Can you speak at all, just even briefly, about the Buffalo Treaty and how it might affect those of us humans and non-humans living in Saskatchewan? Yeah, the Buffalo Treaty was uh, written by Le Dr. Leroy Little Bear. He's uh, from the Blood Reserve from and I, Blackfeet in, in Blackfoot in southern Alberta. Uh, he wrote this as a, a treaty as a way of um, establishing relationships between other uh, tribes and, and nations in Canada and the United States. And now there's over, I think, over 30 signatories to the uh, treaty. Uh, and it's bringing back the whole concept of relinking bison and, and First Nations people in Canada and the U.S and helping to justify bringing bison back to reserve lands. Uh, and it's happening in, in very rapidly across Canada and the US. Uh, bison on First Nations land is the best hope uh, to increase the number of bison populations. Uh, so the treaty is a tremendously successful uh, effort. It's the only time in history where different nations of indigenous people signed a treaty of cooperation. Uh, tremendous document. Wow, oh, that's, that's great. Um, so I think that is all we have time for. Um, and I'm not seeing any other comments come in right now. So um, I will just say thank you, Wes, so much for your presentation. Um, You're welcome. I, was, and I, I, I need know. to give one little shout out uh, to Nature Saskatchewan. Um, they provided funding for the production of the, of the book as did the Canadian Bison Association and, and many other donors. Uh, without their financial support, uh, this book would have been easily $100 a copy. Uh, so I have to thank them for their support in, in getting the book out in an affordable manner. Oh, wow. It is, um, I can say as somebody who has flipped through the pages of the book, it is a very impressive book. Um, and yeah, um, Thank you, U of R Press, and everyone who helped make it happen. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Johan for the photography because it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you. I look for uh, Ecological Buffalo at a uh, local bookstore such as McNally Robinson, Saskatoon, uh, Turning the Tide in Saskatoon, or the Penny University in Regina. Um, thanks again to the funders, including Canadian uh, Creative Saskatchewan, uh, Canada Council for the Arts, um, and uh, everyone who helps make <laughs> Book Week possible. Yeah. Um, and thank you all for joining us, everyone in the audience. Thank you, Logan. Good night. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>